I am so pleased to introduce the next session of the Cassetta Hall Forum. Tonight, we will be taking a 40-minute walking tour of an exhibition of African-American artists in Texas, led by the exhibit's curator, Christopher Beer. The show includes 29 works of art representing 16 artists. It is on view through March 12th at the African-American Library at the Gregory School, a branch of the Houston Public Library System. The works in the exhibit are all from the extensive Texas art collection of John Now, who lives here in Houston, where I am tonight. Christopher Beer, our tour guide, is the curator of the Now Collection. You may have noticed that the Cassetta website has a great bio on Chris Beer. However, for our purposes tonight, I think the most important thing I want you to know about him is that beyond his Beyond holding an MFA in curatorial practice, Christopher has been a practicing artist himself for a number of years, uh, exhibiting his work both nationally and internationally. I feel his artist-trained eye and direct understanding of the artistic process really helped inform the conversations he has had with many of the artists about their work. And one last thing, during the tour, be sure to send in questions via the chat or Q&A functions because there will be a live Q&A as soon as the tour concludes. So without further ado, let's go see the exhibition. Hi, I'm Christina Grubitz and I'm the curator for Houston Public Library. Welcome to the African American Library at the Gregory School. Hello everyone, my name is Danielle Barnes Wilson. I am the former manager and curator of the African American Library at the Gregory School. The Gregory School was opened in 2009 it's the third special collections part of the Houston Public Library system. I also like to say it's special because there's exhibition space. Every three to four times a year, there are exhibitions in our special gallery that concentrate on the history, culture, and sometimes the art of African Americans. We're pleased to have this presentation of African American artists in Texas from the John Now collection. Oftentimes you find in personal collections, there is an exclusion of black artists. That's why I was pleasantly surprised and pleased that John now felt that he could include African-American artists in his collection. And although this isn't um, comprehensive to um, the, the African-American artist in Texas, but it does give you a great glimpse into a lot of the greats, like John Biggers, uh, Harvey Johnson. But then you'll see some artists that maybe you haven't heard of, like Doc Spellman. This project began in 2019 when I spoke with Christopher Beer, who is John Now's curator, about presenting this. And it felt that, or I felt that this collection was important um, and it was important to show this at the Gregory School that's also actually in archives. So not only can people come and see the selection of artwork, but they can go upstairs to the second floor and actually learn about these artists and engage in a way that, um, and engage in a way that's important. Um, so without further ado, let's start the tour. I'd like to introduce Christopher Beer curator of the John Now Collection. Cool. Take it away. Awesome. Thank you, Danielle. And uh, welcome, Cassetta, to uh, my latest exhibition, African American Artists in Texas, selections from the John L. Now III Collection of Texas Art. I want to thank Danielle and uh, Christina Grubitz for their support through this process. So I want to thank Mr. Now as well, because uh, without his support, the exhibit would not be possible. I've personally had the uh, pleasure of serving as curator for the past two and a half years. Uh, but uh, the collection's been going uh, long before my tenure. 
Uh, it started with a significant purchase of 75 paintings from the Torch Energy Collection in 2003 and really has been growing ever since. Uh, it includes uh, drawings, prints, paintings, and sculpture, uh, all with the goal of assembling uh, the nuanced and unique story of Texas through its art. Mr. Now is really interested in having this collection be used as an educational tool, and as such, having an exhibition at Gregory School seemed to be a perfect fit. Uh, we uh, have divided the work very, very, you know, uh, not cut and dry, but as a mix of outsider or folk artists and then classically trained artists, uh, many folks that went to TSU uh, and taught by Dr. Biggers uh, uh, are on display on uh, another side of the gallery. So Dr. Biggers' work is the first uh, work in the tour, and so come on, let's go have a look at uh, the work. So we'll begin with this first piece called School and Schoolmates, made in uh, circa 1966. The piece features an old style classroom. Uh, you've got your wood burning stove back there um, and your blackboard. All these things aren't too common in classrooms nowadays, but uh, that's something you might see actually here in Gregory School. Uh, we've got, uh, they've got several different exhibition, uh, permanent exhibitions, and one of them is a period school uh, room that is just down the hall from this space. Dr. Biggers, he was a giant of influence uh, amongst many of the artists that are featured in the show. In 1949, he moved uh, from Alabama to come and uh, help develop and started essentially the uh, art department at TSU, Texas Southern University, which is a historically black university here in Houston. Let's go look at some more of his work on the other wall. So, we have two works here by Dr. Biggers. Uh, they, are, they also represent two stages in his life. So, and in kind of his career of making. The first piece here, uh, we have The Sleepers, uh, which was paint, uh, drawn in 1951. And then here, a lithograph entitled Upper Room, which was printed in 1984. Uh, as mentioned before, we can see uh, two great examples throughout the artist's career where he definitely evolved and uh, added elements to his practice to create uh, an evolvingly rich body of work. Uh, and speaking uh, with the students, you know, uh, I uh, learned that life drawing was a really, really important part of uh, Bigger's curriculum. And so looking at this first piece, we can see he is uh, Holding to that, uh, drawing these figures, very sensitive about the volume that is created by the di different cross-hatching. Yeah, he just has this very, very rich visual vocabulary that is created by mark making and the value structure that he's made. Now over in Upper Room, uh, created many years later, it was printed by uh, Hand Graphics in Santa Fe. And uh, the uh, work's title, it comes from a uh, Christian devotional of the same name. Um, he, uh, you can see how the style is much different. He still has those really, really nice uh, value structures and the different figures and forms, but the picture plane is essentially flat. And so he's become more interested in adding these elements and making them flow and move together to create the allegories that he's sharing as opposed to, as in the sleepers, truthfully uh, depicting these figures. And so. In my mind, this piece, you know, it's analyzing several different themes. It's, he's got the reverence towards uh, his cultural heritage, the power and strength of women, and their role in the family and home and in society. And he's got elements of transformation and, you know, the tanglings of past standards and whatnot. And so coming together, all it becomes this whole story that has many different angles and different entrance points to, uh, to experience it. So, um, taking Dr. Bigger's work, we'll then move along uh, to one of his students. We have uh, this piece in uh, particular is called uh, The Cock Crowed Thrice, and it was made in 1979. Uh, I was fortunate enough to talk to uh, Mr. Johnson about this work. 
The piece itself uh, works with the idea of middle passage, and it's the idea of middle passage told in three parts. Now, we'll go into that in a sec, but I would venture, I, it's my guess, he uh, told me that the uh, rooster in the piece uh, represents man, and, hit, and thus the cock crowing thrice. It represents man, the sun, and all things that uh, stem from that. Now, in the center, the focal point of the piece is a uh, mother in the middle of giving birth, and there's another woman that's consoling her. He uh, says, uh, in his mind, uh, the woman's consoling while the, the woman giving birth is going through and confronting kind of the, both the trials that her new child will face, but also is excited by the possibility and the prospect of this new life. And so there's this duality here that the woman is uh, wrestling with. Now, the said that it was a part of Middle Passage, and so this birth is the first. Uh, the second is this idea that overall, Middle Passage still hasn't stopped, and it still is this thing that has not died in our society, and so it's something that we need to think about and address. Um, the third uh, element here uh, that we can see in the far corner uh, to help us guide in this addressing, uh, but you know, to help the woman more specifically are these elders, these uh, they're the uh, ancestors that they've lived through uh, the struggles. They know what she's going through. They know what will happen uh, in the future. Uh, they've got a sense of it because history repeats. And so they're there to provide support, strength, and guidance as she uh, and the child move on through their lives. All right, so moving along. We come to the work of Carl E. Hall. Hall studied with Biggers at TSU, graduating in 1976. Before TSU, Hall grew up in Houston's uh, Sunnyside neighborhood and, uh, you know, said that he drew all the time. And at, when he got to high school, he was uh, able to get into some art courses and so got to start to paint and draw. And uh, then you know, after a few detours and a few years later, he uh, ended up at TSU in uh, Dr. Bigger's art department. You know, and on Dr. Bigger's, uh, Hall says uh, he was like a preacher that would fire you up and motivate you. You could always see by the work that he produced that he knew what he was saying and he meant what he was doing. And so uh, the focus that Bigger's, you know, had placed on these technical skills allowed, you know, Hall to make whatever he wanted, and in turn, he got to uh, start to play with some ideas conceptually about how he arranged uh, elements in his pieces and uh, what he included and what kind of styles he wanted to represent uh, with this craft. And uh, he's developed, uh, he took all of that information and his passion uh, for spirituality and religion, uh, he's a very, very religious man, and developed a uh, uh, practice the uh, style that he calls gospel surrealism. Now, uh, we can see elements of the gospel surrealism as things are kind of disparately placed in this picture frame. Uh, we've got an avian fowl, uh, or a little fowl there, and you've got uh, two women, and then there's this cloth that's hanging out in the uh, foreground, kind of suspended in air, and that, uh, to Hall, represents the spirit um, as it kind of travels between, through uh, all of us and all things. So the other artwork that we have on display, and we'll walk over here on the adjacent wall, are uh, monoprints that he made in 1979 uh, when he was in graduate school working uh, to get his master's uh, in fine art at, uh, in Clear Lake. Uh, so each of these uh, prints, they're mono prints, so they're uh, painted onto a piece of acrylic and then transferred onto paper, and it allows for all of these really loose and active uh, marks and different color shifts and uh, whatnot. So he had a lot of fun making these. The subjects are derived from personal photographs. So you've got his uncle uh, hanging out in uh, Flatonia, his friend Sam with their cockatoo, and then you can tell even back in the you know, the late 70s, he was thinking about that surrealist thing. And so this piece, you've got to have faith. Uh, we see the horse in the foreground, but then there's a tuba and a red door and this angel. And is that a turkey? I don't know. But uh, 
all of these disparate elements that kind of come together to uh, provide imagery that then, uh, you know, gives some meat to the work. Taking that idea of loose mark making, I thought that placing Doc Spellman, who is one of the few uh, in this, uh, on this side of the gallery that did not study at TSU, but I thought that that kind of loose uh, mark making and the fluid uh, colors kind of worked with uh, what Spellman was doing technically. Um, these two pieces now, uh, you know, like I said, uh, we move a little bit away from Doc Spellman, a little bit away from TSU. Uh, Ruth McCrane, uh, who made this beautiful piece here untitled, uh, she went to TSU, was studying there in the early 50s or so, but uh, there's no mention of her working with Biggers or whatnot, and so I'm sure they crossed paths, but uh, that's not the most important part of her story, I think. So uh, we look at these two pieces, um, and I put them together kind of as an homage to an exhibition that was done in 1996. Uh, it uh, was held at, and I'm going to check my notes, the Museum of African American Life and Culture in Dallas, uh, Texas. So Art in America wrote a review uh, and had some uh, comments on the remarkable similarities between these two folks. Uh, both artists were born in Texas in the 1920s. Uh, McCrane was born in 1929 in Corpus Christi, and Spellman was born in 1925 in Jefferson, Texas. Uh, they both had professional art careers during their working lives. Uh, McCrane uh, served as a school teacher for 33 years, uh, while Spellman worked in the Air Force as a combat illustrator. Uh, by the end of, uh, you know, their studies, um, prior to their work, uh, they both uh, earned doctorates, um, so they had achieved a high, high level of uh, education, educational uh, success, and Spellman is noted as uh, being a, uh, a huge fan of educational excellence, as he put it. So uh, they both retire, and they both started this uh, very dedicated art practice um, where they Instead of using the technical skills that maybe they learned in school or um, in seen elsewhere, uh, they, they went to a more folk art motif and started producing works as such. McCrane, uh, we'll talk about Untitled first a little bit. She uh, was quoted as saying, I've only ever painted those things that I've seen with my own eyes. Places I've been, things I know about. So this included things like the classroom place where she spent 33 years, and she very aptly depicts all of the bustling and vibrancy and kind of joy that happens inside of the learning environment of, uh, of a busy classroom, elementary classroom. It also included uh, scenes from her family, uh, from her church, uh, and uh, also music clubs. Uh, this last part, uh, the last one, uh, is where she gained national recognition. She uh, was picked up by the House of Blues and produced artwork for all of the, uh, I don't know if all, but many of the uh, locations all across the US. Uh, Spellman, he was prolific in his own way. He worked in San Antonio and uh, he would just paint, paint, paint. And uh, he uh, painted stories, you know, that he thought needed telling. Uh, he thought and, uh, I agree, you know, that art is a great means for working through tough issues, tough ideas, and a great way to pass along history and uh, really talk about uh, complex ideas. So he also knew something about the art game. Um, he, uh, the backs of his pieces, if you ever get a chance to look, are covered in this provenance that, uh, you know, labels that have prices and size and year created and then bios and galleries shown and he would apply most of these, uh, at least the pieces I've seen. Uh, and they're kind of whimsical, but also, you know, sh showed that he knew what people were looking for when they were uh, purchasing art and uh, uh, aimed to please. And so they're, they're just really something to experience. They're, they're very cool. So uh, these two works, you know, on uh, the surface also, you know, uh, engage the subject of children from two places in time. Uh, while McCrane depicts, you know, as I said, the jubilant, vibrant classroom uh, with all of its happenings happening all at once in tandem, uh, Spellman's work is, you know, a call to a different time and a different experience. 
Uh, he really believed that it was important to remember and reflect on history so that we don't forget the struggles of the past and, uh, you know, because they certainly do impact our present. All right, so transitioning to across to this side of the gallery, we come to the great Kermit Oliver. Oliver was another student of Dr. Biggers who really took to heart the dedication and focus it would take to achieve his personal goals as an artist. Uh, even as a student, uh, Oliver had these really great and uh, fantastic ideas, uh, but he knew he needed to practice his craft and further study the stories that he was interested in, uh, such as Greek mythology and stories from the Bible, uh, to manifest the detail-rich imagery that he's known for. Uh, this dedication to craft really set uh, Oliver, who entered with the belief that he would only really uh, ever amount to an art educator, which, you know, an art teacher, that's ton, being a school teacher is tons of responsibility, but that was going to kind of be the limit, and any kind of gallery representation uh, might be kind of, a, kind of a dream. Oliver proved him wrong, though, uh, proved everyone wrong, and uh, became the first uh, African-American artist in Houston uh, to get gallery representation at DuBose Gallery. Um, so, uh, despite the success of uh, having exhibitions, selling artwork, uh, Oliver really didn't think that uh, art making was uh, the best means to set up a household, yet prepare to have a family and support them. Um, and so, he decided to take a second job uh, at the post office where uh, he worked, and he, he was a teacher after school for a little bit, but soon after, started working at the post office, and then relocated to Waco, Texas, where he lives and works still. Um, he spent many, many years uh, working there, uh, sorting letters, and uh, then painting. And when I read his uh, schedule, uh, his repeti you know, what, his, uh, what he did, uh, I was blown away. He would wake up at uh, 11 at night, go to work, work at the post office until six. He'd come home, try not to fall asleep for an hour, and then uh, work on his painting and drawing until six at night th that day. Go to sleep for a few hours, five hours or so, and then wake up at 11 to start it all over again. This dedication, uh, you know, is, uh, you know, can be seen in these exemplary works that, you know, he's got this straightforward, simple attention to detail that allows him to render all of these things in a very realistic way. It's, uh, they're really beautiful to take in. Uh, uh, and, you know, they always hark back to this Texas agrarian lifestyle that he grew up in uh, and, you know, where he was raised. So, uh, the last thing to note, uh, it's kind of fun, we don't have any in the exhibit, but the same dedication also led Oliver to become the first and only American to design scarves for the fashion uh, luxury fashion designer, Hermes. Here we have uh, the end of kind of our TSU alumni tour, uh, so to speak, uh, and feature a uh, drawing by the uh, great Willie Moore, uh, or Willie Moe, as he was known uh, by family and friends. Uh, after Moore uh, went to TSU, he uh, was uh, spent his career teaching in public schools and uh, then also making his art, refining his craft. Uh, this particular piece is a mural study that he made for in the uh, year 2000 for the CHHCACH uh, HC Wayfinding Project uh, that they were doing back then. Uh, so these three artists uh, we see uh, in these three specific works actually were made uh, at Little Egypt Enterprise, which is a print studio here in Houston that was founded by David Folkman. And they would pull in artists that worked on, uh, in other mediums such as painting, sculpture, uh, and whatnot. And uh, they would teach them uh, principles and techniques of printmaking, and then work with them to kind of uh, flush out their concepts and ideas and produce a body of work. This piece here uh, was made by Bert Long. Uh, it's called Chalice, and it was made in 1979, so right as Little Egypt was getting started, and uh, also right as Bert was uh, really focusing on his art practice. 
before this, he had been a uh, cook and worked in the, on the West Coast and uh, in California, I think in uh, Las Vegas too for a time. After he was done cooking and serving up delicious meals, he uh, dropped back on down to Texas, came home, and really dedicated himself to his craft. He uh, was a self-taught artist, and he was known for his paintings, sculpture, and uh, assemblage, and uh, also made ice sculptures that were really fantastic. He's got a great website that's kind of a blast of the past uh, in terms of how it's built, but it's really fun to explore and kind of see uh, where his mind was at in terms of art making at that time when it was created. James Bettison, uh, alongside him, was a painter that uh, played a lot with whimsical uh, themes of the time, added figures, and had a cast of characters that he would work with in his different, uh, uh, different pieces that he made. Uh, he was one of the first, uh, or an early participant anyway, for Diverse Works Artist in Residence program. And uh, while he was there, he was working at J.C. Penney's uh, uh, just to make ends meet. But by the time he got out of that program, he had a show at the MFAH, uh, which is uh, pretty notable, pretty amazing, and was a part of uh, the landmark Houston exhibition, Fresh Paint, uh, the Houston School. So both of these gentlemen, uh, also uh, were founders of a very, uh, another very significant Houston art uh, institution, Project Row Houses, which uh, for those who are not familiar, uh, it's a project that reimagined a block of shotgun houses in Houston's third ward to become a place that manifests positive, creative, and transformational experiences for the surrounding neighborhood and its participants. And Danielle uh, is their newest curator. And so I'm really excited to see the uh, work that she does there, and uh, it's a great organization, a great place. Anastasia Sams. Anastasia, she was a designer by trade. She had a studio practice where she would paint uh, primarily feminist themes uh, and would show at galleries around town. Um, she would work on public mural projects um, and place other placemaking uh, projects uh, in Houston. And um, she also uh, was a writer she was active all around town uh, with Little Egypt, uh, and she also, uh, a year before she passed, uh, was in the second round at Project Row House. Her project there, uh, I thought was really special. Um, she went and worked, uh, found 12 kids that were, uh, lived in the neighborhood and painted each of their portraits. She then went and uh, made copies of those paintings, got them framed nicely, and hung them in her house uh, to create her installation. After the show had run its course, she then invited the kids to take the portraits home and thereby spreading art into the community uh, further, uh, which I thought was just great. So this piece here is uh, a little composition she made as a thank you for her time uh, at Little Egypt. Um, so, with that, we will move across the gallery uh, to look at uh, the rest of the work. Uh, this wall here begins with the great Rosalia Cleopatra Thrash. Rosalia C. Thrash. Thrash was born in Waco uh, in 1893. After completing her master's in education, Thrash served as a teacher in the Dallas School District for 45 years. She was an active member of her community at the time, participating in all kinds of local art clubs. And uh, something most of note, I think, as uh, in terms of her art career, is that in 1935, she became the first uh, black female artist and black artist in general to be featured in the annual Dallas Allied Arts Exhibition. So, that was great, but unfortunately, due to segregationist policies, black visitors were not allowed uh, into the space, but for two hours during the entire exhibition run. You can see here that she uh, is painting what she knows, you know, kind of uh, uh, a landscape surrounding, kind of looks like the Dallas area, hill country-ish, and uh, uh, is painting from life, and it's gorgeous, the different transitions and whatnot, her mark making, very, very great, good work. So we'll move along. Uh, Alongside it is another painter that was painting what he knew, uh, Walter Frank Cotton. Now this is the oldest piece in the entire show. We think it was made around 1938. The piece is titled Freedman Aid School, by the way. 
So Cotton was born in Limestone County, a uh, place where his family had lived uh, uh, for a generation, and uh, it's a place he held dear to his heart. After serving in World War I, he uh, spent his time recording the histories of his community, writing two books uh, on the subject, and also then illustrating the books and painting other scenes that uh, represented moments uh, from his community's history, uh, from this uh, community living in Limestone County. So this particular work is painted on cardboard. You can see kind of the undulation now, but he had back then tied little uh, wires into uh, help keep the work in plane. And uh, so there's all kinds of little like hand-touched elements uh, in this composition, which really make it special. Um, he's got this uh, inscription here, Freedman's Aid School, the title in Limestone County, Texas, 1876, uh, placing uh, the time of the piece with Will Corey as the teacher. Uh, you can see here Will Corey. So uh, to kind of put tell the background of the, the composition, it uh, features a school that was repurposed in uh, uh, or a school that was repurposed in uh, 1876, as dated, from an abandoned cabin used uh, in the past to house enslaved peoples so that the children could learn to read. Uh, the teacher, Will Corey, uh, was a white teacher who, with his brother, taught students in the county, and uh, much to the uh, chagrin of some of his uh, white counterparts that lived around uh, uh, the area where they taught. Um, uh, so Cotton felt that uh, this story was important, uh, an important benchmark in the story of Limestone County and needed to be represented and was as truthful as he could about it. So we'll move on uh, to the last uh, example on this wall, uh, the Reverend Johnny Swearingen. Now we're going to come back to him uh, later on in the talk, but uh, he's another guy that uh, painted from lived experience. He's a self-taught uh, outsider artist and uh, uh, spent his youth uh, working with his parents as a migrant farmer. And so one might expect that this might have been something that he would have seen or experienced uh, as he was younger. And you know, he didn't pull the punches. He wanted to tell these stories, even if they were tough, because they happened. And he wanted to be truthful about uh, what he represented in his practice. So taking the idea of painting from your life and doubling down leads us over here to the work of John Willard Banks. Now Banks created all of his drawings from memory, uh, detailing moments from his life, stories told by his family, and places he remembered from his youth. He lived much of his life in San Antonio. He moved there when he was a young man, but he was born in Guadalupe County outside of Seguin, uh, Texas, and uh, so when he'd go home, uh, he would notice these places from his childhood and decided, you know, like, I need to, these need to be remembered. So he did it, and he did it with anything he could find. You can uh, get up close and you see that there's markers and pen and pencil. Uh, he's got crayons and all different types of, uh, you know, media to create these rich marks and the details and the colors that uh, make these pieces so charming. Um, the colors and you know the manner of how pigment was applied is one one layer. But then if you look at all the details of the pearl beer and the sausages and uh, the different fruits, and as we move down uh, logos and whatnot, he really did his best to be uh, accurate in what he was rendering. So in his words, it's history, it's the truth, and I want to draw it. So then we move on. Uh, over here to uh, one of my favorite pieces in the show, uh, Grandpa's Devil House, painted in 1952, drawn, sorry, uh, by Frank Albert Jones. Uh, this artist drew from experience just like Banks, but uh, his circumstance was a little bit different, much different actually. Uh, Jones was born in Clarksville around the year 1900. They don't have a birth certificate for him, but this is kind of what you know, what they guess. Uh, when he was born, he had an extra piece of skin over his eye, uh, a veil, so to speak, and uh, it led his mother to tell him uh, later that forever during his life he would see spirits and demons. 
Um, this would come to pass, at least in Jones's eyes. Uh, due to very unfortunate circumstance, uh, with relationships with extended family and possible mental illness, uh, Jones spent a great deal of his life in prison. While serving his third and last term, uh, which last went, ranged from uh, 1961 to 1969, he discovered he had an insatiable need to produce drawings, uh, which were representations of the visions he had had all of his life. He created them using old red and blue accounting pencils that he had salvaged from the prison's accounting office and drew on whatever paper he could find. Uh, when he first started drawing, he would sign the uh, drawings with his uh, prison number because he didn't know how to write. And we can tell that this specific work is a little bit later because he's written Frank Jones at the bottom. Uh, the devil houses, as they were called, contained these haints, which are these little demons or ghosts that he would see. But it would also contain different elements that he feared uh, out, in, out in the world, things like clocks, which he didn't really understand. And, uh, and so he would compartmentalize those in with the haints and these structures uh, that he would create. And then there would be these elements that were outside. And so, uh, yeah, it's all him working kind of through this, through his ideas about these haints and uh, order of life and, and many, many things. So now his story uh, has somewhat of a happy turn. Uh, as uh, Jones was discovered uh, by uh, Murray Smithers in the prison art show in 1964. So this discovery led to his work uh, being shown all over the country, entering group exhibitions and eventually becoming part of major collections, including the Smithsonian American Art Museum's collection. So we'll move along uh, to another artist that uh, is playing with grids uh, in their work, uh, but using it as a different, uh, kind of a different context uh, entirely. So this is uh, Cedric Huckabee. Um, he was born in Fort Worth in uh, 1975. Um, but this first piece is uh, entitled From Blues to Jubilee. And uh, it's acrylic paint on paper. Uh, he has, it appears to me to be a study of a quilt, but uh, then he's attached these two pieces of paper together at the seam in the middle, kind of mimicking a quilt structure. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, much of his work draws upon imagery from uh, African-American families and, uh, and their heritage. And so it makes sense that quilts uh, are a part of his uh, voca visual vocabulary. Yeah, so we'll move on. Now uh, here to uh, another grid, uh, quilting of dollar bills maybe, um, Little D uh, and the dollar. Uh, so here we see Huckabee painting a portrait of a boy overlaid over top of all of these uh, dollar bills. Uh, the boy comes uh, as a member of his community, uh, someone he knows, and so he's kind of making that record of uh, family and friends uh, immediate to him and uh, what's remarkable is kind of this impasto, this rich texture that uh, develops out of the face that uh, is quite uh, stunning to see in a uh, person and uh, really uh, accentuates the facial features of uh, Little D. Uh, we can also see uh, in the dollar bills that surround him that Huckabee's uh, altered them, either flipping them over to uh, distort things a little bit, adding in uh, pictures of Dr. King in places, adding in little texts and changing words throughout, and so really engaging with all elements of the composition, not just the uh, portrait and the face. Um, so uh, something that uh, I read, a uh, quote from Huckabee, uh, from one of his artist statements, uh, I thought really tied things together is this. Uh, for me, the act of painting is not just a means to a product, but it is also a meditative process of communication. Uh, thus, it is with the visual language uh, that I choose to speak about most, uh, the most pressing issues of life. So, back to Reverend Johnny Swearingen, and I told you before that we would come back to him. So, here he is. Now, a uh, little bit of background. 
Reverend Swearingen was born outside of Chapel Hill in uh, 1908. Uh, as I mentioned before, his parents were sharecroppers and he spent a great deal of time in his youth out in the fields, only really ever getting through uh, grade eight in uh, his schooling. Um, at some point, uh, when he was a teen, he uh, started hopping trains and traveled out uh, west, eventually ending up in California, where he would uh, discover art and uh, find that passion uh, that he would carry with him throughout the end of his life. Uh, he returned to Texas to take up two disciplines, uh, preaching and painting. Uh, these passions would intertwine as he uh, was known to stand outside the courthouse of the uh, city he lived in. and. Uh, while painting, preach to anyone that would listen. So uh, his uh, known body of work uh, was made between the years of uh, 1950 and 1993. Uh, as he progressed in his painting career, uh, it's noted that uh, the detail of uh, the compositions got a lot looser and a lot less refined, and so there would be bolder moves and uh, made uh, in each of the pieces as opposed to his earlier work where it was more meticulous and uh, details, uh, small details were focused on. Um, so here we see two mid-career paintings, one a little bit older than the other. Um, we can kind of see the uh, proof to this example. Uh, first, Cowboy Roping Steer, uh, which was made in 1978. Uh, so this was the later piece. And we can see how he's kind of pulled these larger big forms together, made really big moves, but using breaststroke and uh, seeing all these hills and valleys, there's a sense of activity, motion, and uh, yeah, just really action in this work, the way he's got his characters moving. So we'll wrap along now uh, to the last piece of work we'll be looking at today um, in the creation of the world, uh, created by Swearingen uh, around uh, 1970. So uh, in this piece, he is pulling from his, uh, pulling, putting his reverend hat on and uh, recounting a famous and well-known story from the book of Genesis uh, about the creation of the world. And he, uh, this piece, this work really uh, is a great example of his ability to tell stories and to use different elements where he's written inscriptions throughout the piece. and. He's got the different layers of water, forest, mountains, sky, uh, stars shining down, uh, all the different beasts that they might encounter. And then these figures that kind of are in action throughout the piece. Well, the figures look very similar and one might think that maybe this is a movement through time as uh, you progress left to right in the piece or right to left. You know, but there, the scale of the work really gives a sense that you have to travel through it instead of just being able to look at it from afar, take a snapshot and, and get it. And so uh, that I think is uh, a very accomplished uh, uh, thing that Swearingen was able to do. So uh, that's the end of the tour for now. We'll walk over here. Uh, there are two more ex uh, elements of this exhibition that I would like to share. Um, so first, uh, upstairs, the Gregory School uh, has put together an awesome collection of books featuring uh, work and stories about uh, the artists in the exhibition uh, that they have pulled from their uh, special collections. And so they are on display uh, upstairs in the reading room and it's a really great place to uh, go and check out. I've had fun uh, going up there and pulling books and learning. We'd also like to know what you think. And uh, so we created this response wall that has different prompts, uh, asking um, the visitors if there was a work that was very important and why, or if they knew one of the artists and want to share a story or have a story that came up because of looking at one of the pieces, or if they have any questions. Uh, we're inviting folks to write any of those uh, things down on these cards and uh, then pop them on the wall for uh, people to read and see. And then uh, ideally we'll, uh, depending on how it goes, uh, we'll collect all of this information and then add it as a community section to the catalog that uh, we're planning to release in uh, January. I wanna thank Cassetta again and uh, my team for making this happen and uh, thanks for watching.
Well, thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, and Chris, that was an amazing tour. Uh, we definitely all got to see a part of John's collection that I'm not sure we had seen before and then also learn more about these artists. So we really appreciate what a great way to kick off our evening. Okay, well, Chris, uh, we've got quite a few questions popping in. So I'm, I'm just gonna start with a few of these that have come through. Uh, so someone did ask just now, and I think this is a great way to start, what makes a piece outsider art? Can you talk a little bit about that terminology yeah. a bit? Yeah, so I think, uh, yeah, outsider art or folk art artist is maybe somebody that, um, is they haven't been trained at uh, the academy at all. They haven't gone to art school um, and they're not using maybe uh, formal techniques such as uh, perspective or, you know, it could be any number of things. And maybe an outside artist would pull some of that into their work, but they're basically, they haven't been trained as an artist. And as such, uh, they're more representing, uh, uh, they'll, they'll, represent the uh, stories or things that they want to represent in kind of a different way. And so uh, it'll have that kind of folk art feel, but it really depends on the artist and kind of what they're doing and where their mind's at at the time. And so they're not directed though by a style or by following impressionism or trying to be uh, a surrealist or something like that, right? So they're following their own, uh, beat of their own drum, so. Got it. Yeah, there's a, a lot of terminology that gets into that and some artists prefer certain terms over others, I think, sure. but definitely. Yeah. Well, one question that's come through um, is about the Roselia Thrash piece. Do you see mm -hmm. any influence of the Texas Regionalists on our work or maybe Hogue or Bywaters or any oh, sure. currents through there? Yeah, I think so. I think that when she was painting those pieces, that was kind of the height of the Regionalist uh, kind of movement, like the uh, that specific work well, yeah, anywhere in between when she was showing, like uh, 35, I think 37 and 38, she also was part of the uh, Allied Arts exhibitions. And so uh, I think totally she was looking at all of those folks uh, and inspiration for what she was doing and then going out and, and painting. And she was also part of uh, at least a handful of art clubs. And so all those folks I would expect were going on visits to the museum or seeing shows and and then painting kind of uh, what they saw and following styles of the time. And so, yeah, so I, I definitely think she was uh, influenced by those folks. For sure. You can definitely see the stylistic influence. Mm -hmm. And subject too, right? Yeah. For time. sure. Um, okay. So one of the artists you reference, uh, you call them Reverend Johnny Swearingen. Can you talk a little oh, bit yeah. about that? I mean, was he actually a practic practicing reverend or? Yeah, so so I mentioned that he had made his way out to California and he was kind of learning how to paint uh, from some sailors that were out there that he had met. And uh, he received word that his mom, uh, his mother was sick. And uh, so he, he was worried. And so he decided it was time to go home uh, from his adventure. And uh, he went back to uh, Brenham uh, where she was staying. And, uh, and so unfortunately she passed, you know, and after she passed, he felt this kind of calling uh, that he, he needed to serve the Lord. And so he uh, went and got a, uh, a, a reverent degree in reverendship. I'm not exactly sure how that works, but uh, he uh, took a correspondence course from Lone Star Bible uh, Correspondence in Huntsville and uh, became a certified reverend, learned, learned how to preach. And so Shortly after that, then he would uh, he would preach and paint, and uh, that's how he spent his time. So, wow, that's uh, really interesting. And one question that came through, and this actually ties into I was curious because I know, you know, a, there's not a lot of research out on mm -hmm. some of these artists. So, what has it been like for you working as John Now's curator, uh, right. researching these pieces, and how have you tackled some of the issues you're having there. And then the second part is actually coming from one of our participants. Uh, are some of these artists represented in museum collections, like the Fine Arts Museum in right. Houston or anyone else uh, that you've seen in some local museum collections? Certainly. Yeah. So I think, I, I don't know for certain, 100%, but I think that like Soringen maybe has a piece uh, 
at the MFA, but I, yeah, I have no idea. And so um, that would be worth looking into. Uh, these artists though, the outside artists are represented though in major museums around Texas and uh, in Washington DC as well, you know, the Smithsonian. So that's pretty cool that they got that recognition. Um, and then in terms of research though, that is really tough. And that's something that to y'all, I, uh, I would say, uh, put research hats on and uh, start writing. Like there's always more research to be done on these folks. Um, but there are some good books, you know, that have been put out through the years uh, that uh, are either on outsider art or their, um, you know, catalogs from exhibitions that all the guys were in together that have really great uh, biographies that I, I've been pulling from. Um, and yeah, so, but more research on all of these folks needs to be done and, um, and would be worthwhile uh, to add to the canon of Texas art. So, uh, yeah. So. Awesome. Yeah, there's, there's always more to do and more to discover out there. Uh, I do want to add for the question about the MFA, uh, their collection is totally searchable. A lot of the museum collections are like the Dallas Museum of Fine Art, Museum of Fine Arts Houston. You can go on just as a public person and search in their collections and see like if it's uploaded online, they'll have info about that to there too. So you can mm -hmm. see what's part of that. And also the Art Museum of Southeast Texas in Beaumont has a pretty substantial, oh, wow. uh, cool. yeah, pretty substantial um, outsider art collection. And uh, so it's definitely one to check out. Uh, we have another question here. Um, great exhibition. How would you place or consider African-American Texas artists within a larger national African-American art history? Does anything stand out or not stand out or any, you know, greater themes you'd like to talk about or? Oh, man. In terms of greater, well, I'm not an expert for sure, but um, like all of these guys, I can say, well, I don't know about all of them too, but I definitely saw from folks that, um, you know, I know uh, in terms of like Doc Spellman, for example, he had, he made these collages that were very reminiscent of Romir Bearden's uh, kind of collage work that he would put together. And um, yeah, all these guys, they were looking at other artists and other things that were happening all around the country, you know, paying attention to what was happening in New York and uh, locally, like uh, um, in Houston at the time, like uh, very active in their art scenes. And so um, in terms of, they, yeah, overall though, they, they were participating. Um, and uh, yeah, they're important uh, bricks in the, uh, the big structure that is uh, art history in the US, you know, in, in the United States, so. For sure. Mm -hmm. um, so someone has asked specifically a, a question about Frank Jones uh, and a little bit more about him. Did he recognize any monetary profit or see any monetary profit from his work? Oh, I don't know about that. I assume he did a little bit. Um, uh, from what I read, it seems like he was made to be more comfortable and he would get, he didn't have to use pencil nubs after a while and he got lots of positive attention and whatnot. And so maybe it improved his life while he was in jail, uh, in prison, but, um, there, there's only so much you can do with wealth. I think maybe if you're in Huntsville and so, uh, yeah, yeah. so so that's kind of a shame. And so, yeah, it's kind of an interesting conversation if somebody is trapped somewhere, you know, in prison and then uh, they're made famous outside, then what happens happens to them there. And so, so I don't think he fully realized uh, what he could have if he wasn't, you know, in, uh, in prison. But I think he did that the people that were representing him uh, mm -hmm. were taking care of him. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. A question about uh, Harvey Johnson came through. Uh, I've heard that he sometimes prefers to be called a poet uh, rather than an artist. Oh, yeah. Has he ever talked about this with you? Yeah, totally. So uh, so Harvey, in his words, is a uh, visual poet. And uh, and so he like when we were speaking, he, he kind of explains. So I'll try to paraphrase. Um, like for him, an artist is like Beyonce, like uh, super over the top, awesome entertainment. Uh, the art is rich, provocative, 
and larger than life, but it is uh, made to make a profit. You know, she makes records and videos to sell CDs and whatnot and ticket events or tickets. And so he's a little bit more cerebral. He, uh, his mind, he wants to investigate deeper meanings of life, uh, answering questions of the who, what, where, when, uh, of humanity, why, you know, uh, are we here? And, and then his own personal existence as well. He's uh, introspective in that sense. And so as he's on this investigation uh, through conversations and, and making, uh, he takes all of, you know, the info that he's got and weaves it in together to uh, create his paintings and drawings. And so his, he's got this focus and intention uh, to investigate, yeah, these questions in this meaningful way and maybe doesn't orient his art making definitely not to like this uh, Western status quo. And yeah, he's, he's really interested in the human condition and, and representing that visually. And so uh, it's not to be, uh, you know, vain or anything like I'm a visual poet, but he uh, thinks that that title fits him better than uh, than what and than the title artist and what that title uh, denotes nowadays. So does that make sense? It's it's interesting to hear Harvey talk as well about his work because it very much oh, fits yeah. that persona. Yep. Um, and so one cool thing at the Gregory School is that they've got a uh, oral history uh, series that Danielle worked on uh, and Harvey is one of the people that she interviewed. And so you can hear him talk all about his life and, you know, about his practice uh, if you go to the Gregory school and, and search their special collections. So. And it's also, yeah, it's a great library. I've, I've gone and done some research there and super welcoming and you can camp out and there's nice tables and yeah. So yeah, it's a good spot. Mm -hmm. A couple of questions have come in specifically about uh, collecting African-American art. Uh, one viewer asked just outside in your experience, at least working with John now uh, mm -hmm. outside of John's collection, what other collections have you come across that have a focus or sub focus specifically on African-American art? Cool. And if you haven't, you know, come across too many, that's fine. Well, you know, like uh, in a past life I was, uh, I worked as an art handler uh, for a time, and it was during uh, the retrospective that Kermit Oliver uh, had had at the Nave Museum in Victoria. And during that, so I can't place names or tell you any of that, but I can tell you that there are many, many, many collections out there that are exceedingly rich and have really great examples by all of these folks. and. Uh, they are in Houston, but unfortunately, you know, <laughs> I can't tell you who they are. Uh, but I, I can, uh, uh, yeah, I can look into it. Anybody's interested? Oh yeah, they, they do exist though. They're around. Um, yeah. Are there any uh, artists that you're actively looking out for to add to the collection? Hmm. Well, um, in terms of African American art, uh, well, so. I like, uh, I'm always looking to find new folks. Oh, uh, I think William Turner maybe uh, is a guy. Anyway, the piece, pieces that I'm really looking for though right now uh, are just nicer examples or different examples of uh, more finished works by Kermit with, because uh, when he would make his, uh, make paintings, he would also build these intricate frames for them that went with the uh, paintings themselves. And so I'd like to try to pull some of those into the collection or one of those, an example of uh, that work. And then, um, yeah, uh, works by, uh, yeah, Harvey and John and uh, try to get uh, more painting. Um, and instead of, uh, cause we've got great drawings uh, but kind of building on uh, the legacies that each of these artists uh, left us. So, um, yeah. Amazing. Well, Chris, thank you so much. I'm sure there'll be, we, we did put, uh, Caleb mentioned in the chat that if your mm -hmm. question was not answered or if you want to chime in with other questions later, we put the Cassetta email address. So okay. we'd be happy to connect you with Chris uh, as he continues his research and work on the collection. This is enlightening for all of us. And I think a great way to reconnect. I wish I could see everyone's faces right now, but hopefully soon. So 
Uh, but thank you, Chris. And we really yeah, appreciate you. it. And thank you to Danielle and all of the staff at the Gregory School as well. And to Mr. Now for sharing his collection with us tonight. So please mm -hmm. convey our thanks to him. Okay, well, I think we're going to turn it over to our fearless leader, Howard Taylor, <laughs> for some closing remarks. <laughs> thank you, Sarah Beth. Uh, good evening, everyone, once again. Uh, earlier today, I was uh, in San Angelo, which is the headquarters of Cassetta. Uh, and now I'm at our house in Kerrville. Uh, and I guess uh, the challenges of having a virtual forum, at least one of the good things, uh, since we can't meet live, uh, this year, anyhow, uh, is that we can work from the comfort of our own homes. And I, I, I hope all of you uh, really enjoyed this program as much as I did this evening. Uh, to me, it represents Cassetta at its best. Uh, before Cassetta, I think a lot of people thought they knew Texas art completely. Uh, we've come a long ways. Uh, we've, and this, I think, is a classic example of the programs you've seen tonight. Uh, of really broadening our horizons about the really amazing and rich cultural heritage of Texas. Uh, I probably shouldn't do this, but I'll remind you that I'm a Yankee. I came here uh, from Philadelphia, and uh, I think there was a time when people didn't have as much respect as they are beginning to have now for the amazing uh, heritage of Texas, uh, the great image makers, uh, and, and so... I think that's one of the real accomplishments and purposes uh, behind everything we're doing at Cassetta, uh, expanding our horizons, and it just keeps growing and growing. Uh, I want to very quickly just acknowledge John now. Uh, John, uh, you're amazing. You've shared your collections with us, uh, this aspect of your collections this evening. Uh, <clears throat> twice you've hosted wonderful uh, entertainments for us. Uh, and the hors d'oeuvres were wonderful, and the uh, cocktails and the music and all that, but indeed, your collections are just astonishing, and thank you for being so generous to Cassetta uh, this evening and over time. Uh, curator Christopher Beers, I couldn't help but notice you started out by saying, cool and awesome. Now, that's a very young uh, way of saying things, but you know, uh, your tour was just brilliant and insightful. Uh, and I think I'll just sum it up by saying cool and awesome. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, you're uh, a young but great addition to the kind of scholarship and the uh, way we're trying to venture more deeply into Texas art. Uh, a couple of people on our team that I'd like to uh, acknowledge. Bonnie Campbell uh, was in early at the beginning. Uh, and then right here at the end, uh, Sarah Beth Wilson. Well, you know, uh, the two of those people, more than anyone else, work so hard to pull this all together. Uh, and virtual programs are a challenge. It's not an easy thing. Uh, so thank you for that. And then I wanted to tell you a little secret about uh, Sarah Beth Wilson. I guess it's okay to let you know this, but she has moved on now to the Manil Collection in Houston. Uh, and I'm not sure I get her title exactly correct, but I think Director of Exhibitions but I'll tell you what, the Manil is one of the great museums of the world, one of the places that I love to go to every chance I get. Uh, and so, Sir Beth, uh, she's our immediate past president. Uh, she did great work uh, in that role. And uh, Sir Beth, uh, we love you, and we're really uh, very proud of you uh, in your new adventure. Uh, we had a brief appearance from Danielle burns Wilson and... Uh, also, she's a person loved and respected by all of us uh, and has that incredible project. She, she's now directing Project Row House. Uh, now, uh, tomorrow, I want to remind you that we're going to begin at 10 a.m. and continue to 4 p.m. continuously, nonstop. And it's going to be a wonderful day, and I'll be there to greet you very briefly in the morning. Uh, we have some great scholars and experts that are gonna talk about leading Texas uh, image makers. Uh, and then uh, I'm looking forward to this. I call it Stump the Experts. At lunchtime, we're gonna have three great people, Stephen Elton, uh, former board member, collector, um, and uh, then also the director of the Museum of Southeast Texas, uh, a very good friend uh, who's really been active in Cassetta over time, but, 
but we're delighted to have Lynn Castle join us. And then uh, finally, our own board member, uh, and I think one of the really great living Texas artists, Noe Perez. Uh, and so you have an opportunity to challenge them, stump them perhaps, and maybe even present to us some new ideas about programming that we haven't yet thought about uh, for the future of Casella. Casella, sorry. Uh, now, two other programs that I'm very excited about, and uh, I hope you will be. I think you're going to really enjoy this. But uh, when we have our live symposiums, for a number of years, we've had our uh, art, uh, well, what do we call it, the art festival or whatever, the art fair. Uh, and we have leading galleries from around Texas. And I think many of you who are collectors know many of these gallery people, but we're going to give you a chance to get to know them a little bit better than you have in the past uh, because we have uh, nine people presenting about their galleries and the auction houses that they represent and in a more intimate way. And so if you're a collector or a novice who has not been there yet, or even you think you've known these people over the years, I think you'll uh, really enjoy the opportunity to uh, meet them more intimately in their space and let them talk about their philosophy, their ideas, what they represent, and some of the current uh, very exciting things that they have for offer. Uh, so anyhow, finally, uh, I do, I want to make a little salute. I have this cocktail here. Uh, it's not exactly a Texas warrior or whatever that was called that Scott created. It does have some Texas uh, uh, ingredients in it. Uh, and I don't know what to call it. I think in honor of Scott Chase, I'm going to call it a Scott Chase Chaser. Uh, so I thought I'd wrap the evening by a salute to Scott, our wonderful board of directors, to the wonderful and just fabulous people who continue to support Cassetta because we need that support if we're going to continue our mission. Uh, and then all of you who are members of Cassetta. So Scott Chase Chaser to Scott, to everyone. Uh, good evening. And I look forward to Seeing you tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Good evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Oh, cheers.